Thank you. Thanks for dropping in. My name is Andrew David Easy, Andy. And uh, I retired recently, and uh, I figured doing presentations like this might be a way to keep me kind of in touch with technology to some extent. I taught photographic technology uh, for about 30 years. I was on the staff of RIT for 45. And uh, I miss my students. <clears throat> so, but uh, as probably uh, you too, I, I was typically hampered by lack of funds. So I've had to improvise, and simplify, and go to fundamentals instead of state of the art. And my uh, objective typically was to explain how things work, and get students hands on experience with. Uh, making things, with uh, running experiments, making measurements, and uh, drawing conclusions from, from analysis of, uh, of photographs. Uh, although I taught at a photography school, which is primarily an art school, uh, I was sort of the lone technology student. Yeah. Felt like a fish out of water, but it was good because nobody knew what I was doing. And uh, <clears throat> publishing uh, kind of kept me at the forefront of activities of the school. So, so it's been a good, it was a good thing. Um, and uh, <clears throat> among uh, my interests were high speed photography. And uh, some of the photographs you saw out there uh, relate to other things in high speed, like infrared and ultraviolet and visualizing density gradients in air and so on. Uh, so, those are technical applications of photography. And, uh, but among those, the one that I mostly uh, enjoy was uh, high speed. In the area of high speed photography, there is something called streak photography or streak imaging. And these days, it's analogous to something in uh, phone cameras called, in other applications, called slit scan. And it's kind of a misnomer for a bunch of things. And uh, this presentation is kind of an offshoot of uh, slit scan approach to imaging. And you can see the power of this in a very simplified fashion. Uh, I should point out that uh, this demonstration, the topic is something that you can buy ready-made commercially. It's very expensive to do, unless you install it as an app in your iPhone or phone. Uh, but there are limitations to that. And of course, getting a ready-made solution and giving it to a student, uh, here, there's push the button, but you have a PhD student, you know, push here button. And I don't like that. I like to have the student understand what is happening and be able to control it. So getting to the basics, fundamentals, is uh, sort of what I'm all about. So, <clears throat> strip chart recorders and oscilloscopes, I think, are, are well known, uh, but we're gonna start by discussing how this process of streak imaging works. Uh, this is an offshoot of it, panoramic photography, and uh, peripheral photography is another one, or rollout, where you make pictures 360 degrees of some object. Uh, <clears throat> getting to very basics, uh, thinking about how cameras make pictures. Well, they have a lens, they have a sensor or film, and then they control, regulate the exposure time, the length of time that the camera sees a subject. And they do it a couple of ways. Well, this, this way, these days, three ways. Uh, using a shutter like this, well, it's both camera. but anyway, it's a moving slot. Moving a, a shutter, or using a shutter like that, which is an open, a hole that opens and closes. And then there's the digital uh, or electronic shutters, which operate slightly differently, but all regulate length of time that the sensor sees come. Well, here's the operation of that diaphragm type shutter. It's a, it's a no hole, which opens into a hole, which gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it closes up. It's called a leaf shark. It exposes the whole image plane all at once. And that's pretty important. It's not the way all shutters work. Uh, so it's simultaneous everywhere. So where, where the opening is this big, it lets that, that much light into the corners, to the center, to that corner, all at the same time. 
increases, decreases. Now this shutter, the focal plane shutter, is a slot. See, there's an image plane back there, and the slot starts here, and then moves down. Well, it, as it moves down, it also gets a little bit bigger because gravity and the spring increases the, the velocity of it. So to keep the exposure time constant, it has to get bigger. That's neither here nor there. The thing is, this is a moving slot. It exposes the sensor of the film also, but it results, it could result in artifacts. If you control the speed on which that moves, you slow it up. And you could make distortions like this one. Where things that don't move don't get distorted. But things that do move interact with the moving slot. And they get recorded at different positions at different times. So she didn't move, he did. In this case, they moved, but the dog didn't. Now this, when you look at this, you know, it kind of boggles the mind. It says, well, what's going on here? You did it, you did it in Photoshop. That's the first thing that comes up these days. Now this is not done in Photoshop. This was on camera original with a moving slot. And so this, as the slot comes down, they're standing still. As it comes down to here, they switch positions, come around again, it comes down to here, and then eventually the picture is completed. Scanning with a slip. To get a, another uh, version of this, we'll take a look at how uh, these cameras uh, operate. And uh, I'll go back to film technology because it's, I think, easier to understand than digital. Uh, film tends to be, I call it human. You can touch it, you can feel it, you can put up the light, you can see where it is. If you have a CD or, you know, what's on the CD? I don't know. I'm going to need, I need a computer to look at it. And even if I do, it might be scratched and it won't work. Or it's film, it might be scratched, but you can still get an idea of what it is, right? So I call film a human uh, uh, device, whereas computers are not inhuman in many ways, more than ways than one. So a film tends to be memory. Essentially, that's what it is. It captures light, uh, photons, light, and it stores it. And, uh, and it gets used up. It is a you know, usable material. So we set up a system that, that's like this. Here's film in the back. This is memory. And it'll move. It'll move past an open slot. When it passes past that slot, it sees whatever is there, stores it in memory, and it moves it that way. So you can think of it, this is the past. It has passed here. This is the present, and this is what's to come. Let's put a signal on there. A signal is an image of some kind. So we'll put this signal, which is a, a white bar, or a lamp or something. This piece of it okay, falls onto that slot. So as the film moves past here, remember it, it remembers what it sees here. It records it and it stores it and passes it on. So eventually, when you look at, the, at, the, at what you have recorded, it'll look something like this. Oops, no, but a line that goes all the way across the length of the film. Because all the time that the film was moving, that thing was sitting there, okay? And it was passing past that slot, recording it. So the time, however, there is different than the time here. That's later. That's earlier, very good, copy, and this is earlier. Now, if that happens to be a lamp, and you turn it on, and then you turn it off, you don't get a line like this, but you might get a line like this. Again, this is time. What can you tell from this? Was it a lamp? Was it a piece of whiteboard or what? You can't. All you can tell is that this, whatever it was, lasted this long, because this is time. If you knew how fast the film was moving, you have a time base, and you can then figure out what the length of time was that that map was turned on for. So if this happens to be two inches long, and you know that the memory device is running at an inch a second, that thing was on for two seconds, right? It's a timing device. It's like a stopwatch. And you can time a lot of things that way. Not just you know one lamp, you could put 100 lamps, and all operate at different times. You record them. 
you get a streak record. Now what happens if that signal, instead of standing stationary, moves? So it's there and there and there, and it moves up that, that slot. What do you think the result is going to be? Yeah. And they have a line, right? And if the uh, rate of the moving film and the rate of the moving image are, are constant, this will be a straight line, right? And the steeper the line, the faster it moves, right? The faster you can figure out that the object was moving. And by scaling it, you can figure out what the object was doing, because what you have here is an image of the object. But they are connected by optics. An optics is, well, this is as, there, there's a, a magnification relationship between the object and the image. Now what happens if the image happens to do accelerate or decelerate? You get a curve line. Now which one of these do you think indicates that the object is accelerating? Uh, one of the lines. Yes, yeah, yeah, right, this one. Why? Because it keeps getting steeper. And if it were straight, you'd have, a, you'd have one of two conditions. The object was moving infinitely fast, or the film was moving infinitely slow. Right? And if you get a straight line, it indicates it's not moving. Right? Anyway, you get you into the moon. Now what happens if the image is this? Moves up and down. Yeah, exactly. You get a wavy line. Now this, from a technical point of view, a technology point of view, this is pretty good stuff. Because now you have, uh, you have a, the period of this event. Okay? And you can figure out, well, how long was it? Well, if you knew what the time base was, again, suppose it's an inch a second, and you measure this from here to here, it's two inches. It's doing one cycle in, okay, tell me. Inches second, two inches, two inches Oh, you want one, one period. One period. And it's two inches, each cycle is two yeah. inches. And the film is moving. An inch a second. So it's two seconds two per seconds. cycle. Two seconds. And if you want to go further, you know, you can, you can figure out what the instantaneous velocity is anywhere because you know what the slope is. Right. So you can, you can now apply some mathematics to this. Wonderful. All you get is, is a streak, though. You know what it is, but you, you, you get a, an image of the performance of whatever object you were looking at. You can do this with a strip chart recorder. You can do this with an oscilloscope more expensive. And, and it's one of these handy pieces of equipment. Now in the digital uh, era, you do the same thing with a linear array. A camera like this one has a two-dimensional image plane. It has height and width. Uh, street cameras of the digital kind have just They, uh, they consist of a series of pixels, maybe 2,000, 3,000 of them, and you sample those every so often. So they look at something, you let them look for that time, you dump the information, and you store it as a line. And then you do it again. And you store the next line next to the previous line. And the next line, the next line. And you accumulate this over time. So again, you, you show time in one dimension, height or uh, a, a real dimension, hyper, whatever it is, in the other. Uh, and you can you can make pictures like this. These these are objects that are twirling on a turntable, uh, vertical turntable, and uh, you can tell that from here to here, this object, whatever it was, went around once. Okay, and the others were closer to the center of rotation is not as far displaced, but this is one rotation. And you can have do other kind of complex things. And you can get arty about this in Photoshop and so on. But that's the interesting thing is time is included in the photograph. These are truly time pictures. They're they're not what we normally consider instantaneous. So here's 
what we're talking about. The strip chart recorder and the oscilloscope. Now, those are pretty, they can be pretty complicated. They can record a number of events, they follow a number of events simultaneously on a cathode ray tube, but still they're limited. Uh, this one is even more limited because it's typically limited to just one point. Okay, you can monitor voltage or resistance or whatever it is, and it displays it. Time in one dimension, time in the other dimension. These are kind of slow in terms of time. These are very fast in time. So they, they give time resolutions of maybe a centimeter per microsecond, or maybe even better. So if you want real fast events, you go with that. If you want slow events, you go with this. High light detectors are like this. EKGs are like this. Uh, when you're trying to do uh, photonic experiments, you go with something like that. So really, what, what these cameras do, these street cameras do, they operate sort of like these do. And what I'm going to do now is to show you how to do it with a, a regular DSLR, what they call DSLR, digital single and reflex camera. A lot of people do have them, you, you guys have them. You can do this. The first thing to do is to eliminate one of the two dimensions that the camera is sensitive to. So we'll eliminate the width dimension. We'll concentrate on the height. The way we do that, we put a mask in front of the camera. You know, a black mask over here, the camera here, leaving a slot in the middle. So now, even though the sensor might have 3,000 pixels, horizontally, we restrict it to only like five or 10 or whatever we can do with that slot, right? <clears throat> then what we do is we turn the camera one way, put the slot at one edge of the frame, and then turn the camera the other way, and the image of the slot will move across the focal plane. So as it does that, it scans itself across the 3,000 pixels. Let me just show you, I think, if I remember, then what happens. So <clears throat> one thing, that, that's fundamental. But <clears throat> as you pan the camera, what you'll notice is that objects in the foreground and the background tend to displace or, or misregister each other. So in order to uh, keep information on that slot, constantly on it, something that's behind it, you need to turn the lens about something called the nodal point. More, the camera is normally turned around the tripod socket. Well, if you do that, then this is what happens. When you aim the camera through the slot, what is the box here with the slot? Right? And you see a pencil there. You aim the camera one way, the pencil disappears. You aim the camera the other way, the pencil disappears. If you turn the camera about the nodal point, notice that pencil is on the slot, it's on the slot, it's on the slot. So you're looking at the same object in the background compared to the slot itself. And I'll show you how that works in a little bit. To make the camera turn about a point which is not the tripod socket, you use something called a parallax bar. Anything that allows you to put the axis of rotation somewhere else. I made a wooden gadget like this, this gets attached to the tripod, the camera gets attached here. Because you have the slot here, you can move the camera back, or forward, or whatever. The tripod turns here, but the camera is attached here. And these sometimes are available at uh, surplus stores and so on. Uh, they're ready-made parallax bars. Now here's what I mean. There's the uh, wooden one that I made before I realized that I could buy a metal one for cheap. Uh, the metal ones are typically used to attach flashes to cameras or something like that. But anyway, so I made the metal one. And look, here's the, the, the parallax bar attached to the tripod. This is what's going to turn. But here the camera's way back. There the camera's much forward. So what we're going to put is the rotation axis of the tripod someplace under the lens instead of where the tripod socket is. Because if you do it there, then the objects will move with respect to that slot. They're not hard to build. Get the idea. Now here is an, uh, sort of a, an example of what might happen, or what does happen. Uh, there's a turntable that rotates that way. It's got these spools on it. The camera is back here. It's looking through the slot, looking at those spools. They're rotating. This is what you get. 
on the road bending, you hear the turntable stop. And then start up again. And this is time. And there are the crayons that are being waved up and down. So you, you, uh, if, if you were interested in, well, how long did it take the, uh, these to make one turn? Well, this is the length of time it took. This is the length of time it took the crayons to go up and down. And the slope, again, indicates velocity. Now, one thing I mentioned is that you could determine what the uh, period is if you had a time base. Well, so far we haven't talked about a time base. What I suggest is that a time base be included in the photograph. And you make yourself something like this. This is an LED and it's flashing. It's flashing 100 times a second. You can't tell that very well, but if I move it, you sure can, right? So this is flashing another kind of second. If we take this and we include it in our photograph, we'll have a time base because the blips of the light will show up as hundredth of a second apart. Yeah. So here's, and and you can you can time them by using by timing the uh, uh, LED by using the shutter on your camera. So you can wave it around. And you set the shutter speed of the camera to some speed. And uh, you count the number of books that you get. Uh, in a hundredth of a second, well, you can get one or two or something or not, uh, because the error is pretty significant there. You know? But if you count a lot of them, in that case, the error becomes better. And you can use a shutter as a timing device. Now, most of us don't think about using shutters as watches, but they are. Manufacturers make those shutters so that they accurately give you the time that they're set for. And then, then you can use them as timing devices. Or you could use a stroboscope. I have a, an affinity for mechanical stroboscopes. That's this one of them. It, it's just a motor and it turns a slot. You can, I think you can buy these commercially. But you can make them for like five bucks. And students can make this too. My students make them. And uh, you apply voltage to it, this thing turns. And as it turns, it passes through the, in front of the camera lens. And if you have a moving subject, you get, you get a stroboscopic picture. You could do this with a flashing light stroboscope, too. It's more expensive, more complicated. This is great for teaching. It, it, it's safe, too. You know, no electricity except for the battery. And uh, if this is rotating and you want to you know, figure out what, what is the time base, how fast is it going, all you got to do is to bounce the ping pong ball up and down, set your camera shutter to some known speed, like a quarter second, okay, and then see how many pictures of the ping pong ball you get. If you get 10 pictures in a quarter of a second, this thing is rotating 40 times a second. So the time between exposures is a 40th of a second. You get your time base. Here's students building stroboscopes. Yeah, probably the most dangerous thing here is the is the exacto knife. <laughs> right. So, but they're pretty useful devices. In some cases, these are more appropriate than the electronic ones. Now, you want to. Uh, uh, you can also time uh, how fast the stroboscope is turning by including it in your photograph that you make with the panning camera. You put the uh, a light of the stroboscope in front, and uh, you, you pan the camera past the slot, except you have to time it right. So uh, a tungsten lamp like this one, turned on all the time, just tells you, well, this is how long, how wide the frame was. Is okay. it open? And that was there all the time. And this is the number of times that the disc runs in front of the camera lens. And uh, so if this is a quarter of a second, you get what? One, Two, three, four, five, six. So a twenty-fourth of a second between flashes. Twenty-fourth, twenty-fifth of a second, something like that. I mean, if you want really precise, uh, this is an it. Okay. But if you want to get the idea, uh, this is very much it. But you have to get the exposure uh, in the middle of the frame of the camera. There it's off on one side. There it's off on the other side. So here is a, is an application of. I'm going to time the performance of a flash bulb. These are tungsten, uh, what do they call them? Yeah, tungsten, they're, they're 
magnesium foil filled flash bulbs. So you power them up and they give you a big flash of light and it lasts for some time. It used to be used in photography. So there's the, the lamp that's going to burn. This is the thing that's allowing light to pass through the slot. The camera is on the other side of the slot. And uh, this is the struggle stroke that's running. It's running every, turning every 25th of a second, 25 times a second. So we got our time base here, and there is a flash that went on. In this case, time is going this way. So it got very bright at the beginning, and then it decayed in output. Well, if you use an oscilloscope and a photometer to do this, you get a curve. You know, it goes like this. In this case, you get a visual uh, description of what the flash did. And you get some other information about, you know, the little pieces of um, material that are still burning. And you get an idea of how long the peak output was, how long the total output was, how it decayed, and so on. Useful stuff. And it's done very simply. In this case, uh, an examination of are things simultaneous or not. So two cameras are, are set up. Uh, students, one student fires one camera, the other one fires the other one, and each camera fires a flash. There are the flashes. There's the uh, stroboscope running, giving you the time base. And the idea is uh, you tell one student to fire the, the camera and ask the other one to do the same after, you know, as quickly as possible after they hear the first one. Testing reaction time, sorry. You're not testing this, and you're demonstrating. You're, you're getting people to think. So, uh, one flash fires, this could have been the first one or the second one, I don't know. And this is the other one. But there's a, a little timeline. You say, well, how long of a delay was there? How long did it take the second student to respond? Well, you say one, two, three, four, five, and something, maybe six, six twenty-fifths of a second, whatever that is. It wasn't instantaneous, that, that's what you know, because if it happened instantaneous, they'd both be in the same place, right? But there's displacement. So, Again, you're looking at time, and that's the powerful thing about street, street cameras. And I think, are we doing it? We're doing good. So, the idea now is to, is to go to a demo. You, you, you ready for that? Um, that's my website up there. And um, if you had a slash uh, articles.html, in that case, you get to a whole bunch of articles, maybe 100 or so, that describe basic uh, applications like this one, or, or uh, situations where uh, you can use a camera to make measurements. And the very, I think the very first article right now is the one that deals specifically with this particular topic. Maybe it's the second one. So what we're going to do, since uh, uh, it's important that the, the camera, uh, which is making the panning and moving that slot across the focal plane of the camera, uh, not record other anything other than what's on the slot, that we exclude light from the, back, from the camera itself. So the camera's in a box, and uh, it looks like this. So the, the top view, you know, will be from here, and the front view is just a slot. And the camera's in the back over here, and it's set on a parallax bar. Uh, you could you could use a, a manual panning device, like a tripod itself, a tripod head. Uh, but it's fairly important that the parallax bar be used. And I'll show you how that works. Uh, again, I spared no expense in securing this box. <laughs> um, it's not intimidating. So here's the, uh, the box itself. Uh, there's the, the slot. The slot is actually quite fine. It's uh, maybe a millimeter or so, maybe two. Uh, you can see it there, be it better. Uh, there's sign baffles uh, about here in the middle of the box. That's because sometimes light goes through the, through the slot and falls onto the walls. And if the camera's aimed at the walls, then they would, then they would expose, their, sort of double expose the uh, sensor. So you don't want to do that. Uh, so the baffles accommodate that. And there's this loose fitting baffle back here to prevent the light from 
as much as you can to, from going into the bunch because you want to keep that pretty black. Uh, here is the manual rotation device, and there's what we're going to use, which is a, a motorized uh, device. So <clears throat> this works. Uh, the only thing is keeping it steady is a little difficult. But it doesn't matter. Uh, you can still get information even though the movement is not steady. In that case, the movement is a little steady. So I guess that's it for that. Now, get this on. Because you're going to get to see what the what the camera is looking at. I'm going to put that on the screen. So I'll take the upper of the camera, feed it there, and you'll see what the camera is looking at. And if you have any commentary or questions, uh, just ask any time. If you should uh, go and visit this article uh, that I mentioned, and uh, <coughs> at the bottom of it there are references to links to other articles that include uh, how to make the stoloscope, they include how to make the uh, parallax bar, uh, how to uh, make the uh, LED flashing as well. Uh, this is, uh, I'm not sure how much electronics you are connected with, but it's based on the 555 IC timer. It's a very common device, very useful device. And uh, I highly, highly recommend you getting to know the 555 or the 556. Oh, I think this needs to have some inputs here. It's good and black in there. So now we're going to, let's turn on the light. Abracadabra. What do you think of light? Okay. So, <clears throat> let's see what we have here. Could I ask you to move up here? Yep. Uh, put you on control of the camera. is a switch it, it makes the camera go one way see it yeah or it makes it go the other way okay okay so let's put it sort of middle and put some light view and uh, see if you can move that slot so it's in the middle of the square not on a parallax bar. It's just attached to the uh, tripod socket and it's turning about there. So make the cam camera turn one way. It, it disappears. Now go it the other way. And it disappeared again. Right? It's not, all, it's, all, all that's happening is the camera is either looking to the left of it or to the right of it. And also to it in the middle. So I'm going to add a parallax bar, and we'll see how things change. of the camera is kind of 
and just say, try on there. So let's try that. Move it one way. Right, you can still see the nut there. Okay, go the other way. We're keeping the nut in view. Yeah, almost. Okay, let's move the camera forward just a little bit. that wooden stick remained in, in view, right? Okay, now, we can put our LED here. Well, I'll tell you what. What we're gonna do now, okay? Set there, and move this over so we see the spring. Time so we can see it. All right. I guess it'll have to be bent. Oh, there it is. Okay. Now. One side. Okay, right there. That's good. And line you up. And we'll make this thing bounce up and down. Oh, so just move. I just move the LED. Maybe it's there. What is it? We'll do it there. Move the camera. Okay, stop it. Yeah. Move the image. Now, okay, we missed the LED. However, we did get the bouncing plate, right? Uh, I'm not that happy with it because I'd like to actually see the LED. Reset a little bit. Stop bouncing. That's not that important. Okay, let's see. All right, we'll uh, move the camera back so it's in the middle. Okay. Let's move the camera to one side. Okay. Okay. 
Get it back to the middle. Oh, yes. Okay. Good. I think I'm going to start to get it going before I. Uh, record the whole thing um, because I had the camera shut set for a shorter time. Okay. Um, now let's see what we can do here. Look at the timing. Okay, it's a little too close together, right? Mm -hmm. So we'd like to maybe stretch those out a little bit so the timing becomes more evident. What we'll do is make the camera turn faster. Okay. Let's see, we'll go back here, back to here. Okay. We'll move it off. Good. And There's springs it's themselves, you can see them. And there's our timing line. And now they're quite easily separated, right? Mm -hmm. be ringing. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we wanted to get, you, you could probably <laughs> get information about the, the distance as the springs separate and stretch and then come back together. If we took a, a closer look at the, at the uh, pattern, And you'd expect this, the springs to be closest together at the top, right? Mm -hmm. So, let's see if they separate. Oh, they separate. Um, when they're most stretched, I think that they seven, that these are further apart than the ones at the top. And if you wanted to get a, an idea of what the period was, well, it's a matter of counting those, uh, <laughs> counting those uh, hundredth, of a, hundredth of a second flashes, right? So there we have from the bottom to the bottom, one period. You can make a measurement, you can apply them after this. If your heart's content, uh, and you've done it with a box and a panning camera. So you've made a, a oscilloscope or a strip chart recorder and your regular DSLR camera. And that is it. I hope I entertained you. That is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a thing that I've been playing with for the last uh, few months. Yeah, I thought it was, wow, 
Now, sure, you probably can't use it in the classroom, right? But, but if you can think about it, you can think about what you saw, maybe there's something that you can do with it. Uh, so again, thank you. Thank you for putting up with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. For one minute now, you're going to see the uh, layout of the experiment with the uh, spring uh, both compressed and, and extended, uh, the LED uh, flasher, and uh, the uh, box that was surrounding the camera, uh, and the camera looked through the, the slot at the uh, bouncing spring, or the bouncing weight. The uh, bottom figure shows the results obtained by this method by panning the camera around about the nodal point and uh, displaying what happened beyond the slot over time with the uh, LED providing the time base and uh, it is now possible to determine the period, the amplitude uh, and a number of other factors. I hope you see that. Thank you.